Section 20 of A Dozen Ways of Love by Lily Dugall A Freak of Cupid, Chapter 4 When the March morning shone clear and white through the still-falling snow, and the morns began to bustle about their work for the day, the mental atmosphere in the kitchen seemed to have lost something of the excited alarm that had prevailed in the night. Courthope arose. The garments which he had donned in the night with frantic speed clothed but did not adorn him. He knew that he must present a wild appearance, and the domestic clothesline, bound round and round his arms, prevented him from so much as pushing back the locks of hair which straggled upon his brow. He was rendered on the whole helpless, however murderous might be his heart, a tolerable safe companion. He interested himself by considering how Samson-like he could be in breaking the cords, or, even tied, how vigorously he could kick Morin if he were not the girl's prisoner. He reflected with no small admiration upon the quick resource and decision that she had displayed, how, in spite of her almost childlike frankness, she had beguiled him into turning his back to the noose when a supposed necessity pressed her. He meditated for a few minutes upon other girls for whom he had experienced a more or less particular admiration, and it seemed to him that the characters of these damsels became wan and insipid by comparison. He began to have a presentiment that love was now about to strike in earnest upon the harp of his life, but he could not think that the circumstances of this present attraction were propitious. What could he say to this girl, so adorably strong-minded, to convince her of his claim to be again treated as a man and a brother? Letters? He had offered them to her last night, and she had replied that anyone could write letters. Should he show her that he was not penniless? She might tell him in the same tone that it was wealth ill-gotten. It was no doubt her very ignorance of the world that, when suspicion had once occurred, made her reject as unimportant these evidences of his respectability. But he had no power to give her the eyes of experience. These thoughts tormented him as he stood looking out of the window at the ever-increasing volume of the snow. How long would he be detained as a prisoner in this house, and, when the roads were free, how could he find for Madge any absolute proof of his innocence? The track of the midnight thief was lost for ever in the snow. If he had succeeded in escaping as mysteriously as he had come, but here Courthope's mind refused again to enter upon the problem of the fiend-like enemy and the impassable snowfields, which in the hours of darkness he had already given up, perceiving the futility of his speculation until further facts were known. Courthope strolled through the rooms, the doors of which were now open. Morin permitted this scant liberty, chiefly, the prisoner thought, because of a wholesome fear of being kicked. In the library at the back of the drawing-room he found amusement in reading the titles of the books down one long shelf and up another. Every book to which Madge had had access had an interest for him. Three cases were filled with books of law and history. There was but one from which the books had of late been frequently taken. It was filled with romance and poetry, nothing so late as the middle of the present century, nothing that had not some claim upon educated readers, and yet it was a motley collection. Upon the front rim of the upper shelf, someone, perhaps the dead father in his invalid days, had carved a motto with a knife, the motto that was also that of the British arms. It might have been done out of mere patriotism, it might have had reference to this legacy of books left to the child maidens, for whom, it seemed, other companionship had not been provided. At length Courthope realized that there was one book which he greatly desired to take from the shelf. The mourned daughter was dusting in the room, and, with some blandishments, he succeeded in persuading her to lay it open upon the table where he could peruse it. To his great amusement he observed that she was very careful not to come within a yard or two of him, darting back when he approached, evidently thinking that the opening of the book might be a ruse to attack her by a sudden spring. At first the curious consciousness produced by this damsel's awkward gambols of fear so absorbed him that he could not fix his attention upon the book. Flashes of amusement and of grave annoyance chased themselves through his mind like sunshine and shadow over mountains on a showery day. He knew not which was the more rational mood. Then, attempting the book again, and turning each leaf with a good deal of contortion and effort, he became absorbed. It was the letters of a Portuguese nun. 
and in the astonishment of its perusal he forgot the misfortune that had befallen the household, and his own discomfort and ignominy. The mourn girl had left him in the room, shutting the door. An hour had passed. It might have been around nine of the clock, when Courthope began to be roused from his absorption in the book by a sound in the next room. It was a low, uncertain sound, but evidently that of sobbing and tears. He stopped, listened. His heart was wrung with pity. It was not the sharp little Eliz who cried like that. He knew such sobs did not come from the stormy and uncontrolled bosoms of the French servants. He was convinced that it was Madge who was weeping, that she was in the long drawing room where the portrait of the judge hung near the door. He went near the door. His excited desire to offer her some sympathy, to comfort, or if possible to help, became intolerable. So conscious was he of a common interest between them that not for a moment did the sense of prying enter his mind. He heard then a few words whispered as if to the portrait. Father, oh father, we were so happy with him. It is almost the only time that we have been quite happy since you went away. The sense of the broken whispers came tardily to Court Hope's understanding through the smothering door. The handle of the door was on a level with the hands that were bound to his sides. He turned himself in order to bring his fingers near it. Before he touched it, he heard Madge's sob and whisper again. I was so happy, Father. I thought it was such fun he had come. I like gentlemen, and we never, never see any except the ones that come out of books. To Courthope it suddenly seemed that the whole universe must have been occupied with purpose to bring him here in order to put an end to her gloom and flood her life with sunshine. The universe could not be foiled in its attempt. Young love argues from effect to cause, and so limitless seemed the strength of his sentiment that the simplicity of her mind and the susceptibility of her girlhood were to him like some epic poem which arouses men to passion and strong deeds. Ignominiously bound as he was, his heart lightened. All doubt of his mission to love her and its ultimate success passed from him. He turned the handle and pushed the door half open. The long drawing room was almost dark. The shutters had not been opened. The furniture remained as it had stood when the brilliant assembly of the previous evening had broken up. The large fireplace was full of ashes. The atmosphere was deadly cold. Courthope stood in the streak of light which entered with him. Upon the floor, crouching, her cheek leaning against the lower part of her father's picture, was Madge King. She was dressed in a blanket coat. Moccasins were upon her feet. A fur cap lay upon the ground beside her. At the instant of his entrance she lifted her bare head, and across the face flushed with tears and prayers there flashed the look of haughty intolerance of his presence. She had thought that he was locked up in one of the kitchens. She told him so, intensely offended that he should see her tears. It was for that reason that she did not rise or come to the light, only commanding and imploring him to be gone. I'm quite helpless, even if I wanted to harm you, he spoke reproachfully, knowing instinctively that if she pitied him she would accept his pity. You have harmed us enough already, she sighed. All the rest of our silver, all my dear father's silver, is gone. We found that out this morning, for what we had used for the feast had been put in a basket until we could store it away. It is all taken. He was shocked and enraged to hear of this further loss. He did not attempt to reason with her. He had ceased to reason with himself. You trusted me when you let me in last night, he said. Don't you think that you would have had some perception of it last night if I had been entirely unworthy? Think what an utter and abominable villain I must be to have accepted your hospitality, to have been so happy with you. So he went on appealing to her heart from the sentiments that arose in his own. Madge listened only for a reasonable period. She rose to her feet. I must go, she said. He found that she proposed to walk on snowshoes three miles to the nearest house, which belonged to a couple of parish priests, where she would be certain of obtaining a messenger to carry the news of this robbery to the telegraph station. She could not be brought even to discuss the advisability of her journey. 
Morn could not be sent, for the servants and Eliz would go mad with terror if left alone. To Courthope's imagination her journey seemed to be an abandonment of herself to the utmost danger. If between the two houses she failed to make progress over high drifts and against a heavy gale, what was to hinder her from perishing? Then, too, there was that villain who had seemed to stalk forth from the isolated house afar into the howling night as easily as the Frankenstein demon, and might even now be skulking near, a dangerous devil, able to run where others must trudge toilsomely. Madge, it seemed, had only come to that room to make her confession and invoke protection at the shrine of the lost father. She was ready to set forth without further delay. She would not, in spite of his most eloquent pleading, set Courthope at liberty to make of him either messenger or companion. The evidence, she said sadly, is all against you. I am very sorry. A wilder unrest and vexation at his position returned upon his heart because of the lightening that had come with the impulse of love. That impulse still remained, an undercurrent of calm, a knowledge that his will and the power of the world were at one, such as men only feel when they yield themselves to some sudden conversion. But above this newfound faith, the cross-currents of strife now broke forth again. Thus he raged. What was the use of my coming here? Why should the fates have sent me here if I cannot go this errand for you, or if I cannot go with you to protect you? If this beast is walking about on snowshoes, how do you know that he will not attack you as soon as you are out of sight of the house? She seemed to realize that it was strange to be discussing her own safety with her prisoner. Very curious was the conflict in her face, her strong natural companionableness, her suspicion of him, and her sense of the dignity which her situation demanded, contended together. It seemed easier for her to disregard his words than to give all the answers which her varying feelings would prompt. She was tying on a mink cap by winding a woolen scarf around her head. Miss Madge, Miss King, it is perfectly intolerable. It, it is intolerable. He stepped near as he spoke. A thought came over him that even the conventional title of Miss, which he had given her, was wholly inappropriate in a situation so strong, that he and she, merely as man and woman, as rational beings, were met together in a wilderness where conventions were folly. I cannot allow you to risk your life in this way. There was a tense emphasis in his words. He felt the natural authority of the protector over the tender thing to be protected, the intimate authority which stress of circumstance may give. She dropped her hands from tying the scarf under her chin, returning for his words a look of mingled curiosity, indecision, and distrust. Quick as she looked upon him, his mind's eye looked upon himself. There he stood in grotesque undress, bound around with cords of an extraordinary disgrace. He blamed himself at the moment for not having had his hair cut more recently, for he knew that it stood in a wild shock above his head, and he felt that it dangled in his eyes. Then a gust of emotion, the momentary desire for laughter or groans of vexation, rose and choked his utterance, and in the minute that he was mute the girl, sitting down upon a low stool, began tightening the strings of her moccasins, which, after the first putting on, had relaxed with the warmth of the feet. Her business-like preparations for the road maddened him, "'Don't you see,' he said, "'what disgrace you are heaping upon me. "'What right have you to deny me, "'a gentleman and your guest, "'the right to serve and protect you? "'Consider to what wretchedness you consign me "'if I am left here, "'to think of you fighting alone with this dangerous storm, "'or attacked by blackguards, "'who we know may not be far away.' "'She said in a quiet, practical, girlish way, it was I who was responsible for letting you in last night, and then this happened, this most unheard-of thing. We never heard of any but a petty theft ever committed in this whole region before. Now I am bound to keep you here until we can hear where Father Silver is. You don't believe that I have done it. I'm sure you don't. He believed what he said. Why haven't you the courage to act upon your conviction? You will never regret it. 
Eliz says that she saw you quite distinctly. Eliz is a little fool, were the words that rose within him. But what he said was, Your sister is excitable and nervous. She saw the thief undoubtedly, and by some miserable freak of fortune he may have resembled me. Does that seem at all likely? Well, then there was no resemblance, and she fancied it. She stood up, looking harassed, but without relenting. I must go. There is nothing else to be done. Do you think I would stay here when a day might make all the difference in recovering the things which belong to my father? Do you think I am going to lose the things that belong to him just because I am too much of a coward to go out and give the alarm? She walked away from him resolutely, but the thought of the lost treasures and all the dear memories that in her mind were identified with them seemed to overcome her. She drew her hand hastily across her eyes, and then, to his dismay, the sorrow for her loss emphasized her wavering belief in his guilt. For the first time he realized how strong that sorrow was. Impelled by emotion, she turned again and came shrinkingly back into his presence. I have not reproached you, she said, because I thought it would be mean in case you had not done it. But it seems that you must have done it. Won't you tell me where the other man has taken our things? They cannot be of any value to you compared to their value to us. And, oh, indeed, I would much rather give you as much money as you could possibly make out of them, and more, too, if you would only tell me which way this man has gone and send word to him that he must give them back. I will pledge you my word of honor that... For the first time he was offended with her. He stepped back with a gesture of pride, which in a moment he saw she had construed into unwillingness to give the booty up. I could promise to give you the money. I could promise that you should not be tracked and arrested. I have enough in the savings bank of my own that I could get out without our lawyer or mamma knowing it, and you don't know how dear, how very dear, everything that belonged to father is to Liz and me. If you wait here tied until my stepmother comes, she will not give any money to get the things back. She would not care if you kept them, so long as she could punish you. Every word of her gentle pleading made the insult deeper and more gross, and the fact that she was who she was only made the hurt to his pride the sore. He could not answer. He would not explain. He would let her think what she liked. It is the way of the injured heart. Angry and confirmed in her suspicion, she too turned proudly away. He saw her, as she crossed the hall, take up a pair of snowshoes that she had left leaning against the wall, and without further farewell to anyone, turned toward the front door. He knew then what he must do. Without inward debate, without even weighing what his act's ultimate consequences might be, he followed her. I will do what you ask. I give you my word of honor, and there is honor, you know, even among thieves, that I will do all in my power to bring back everything that has been stolen. Give me snowshoes. Keep my horse and my watch and my luggage as surety that I mean what I say. I cannot promise that I will get back the silver from the other man, but I will do far more than you can do. I will do more than anyone else could do. If it is within my power, I will bring it back to you. She considered for a little time whether she would trust him or not. It seemed, curiously enough, that from first to last she had never distrusted her first instinct with regard to his character, but her childlike belief that in the unknown world all things were possible allowed her to believe also in his criminality. Now that he had, as she thought, made his confession and promised restitution, it was perhaps the natural product of her conflicting thoughts and feelings that she should trust to his oft-repeated vows and make the paction with them. She did not consult the Morins. Perhaps she knew that she would only provoke their opposition, or perhaps she knew that they would only be too glad to get rid of the man they feared, caring for nothing but the actual safety of the lives of the household. She brought him his coat and cap, and also a man's moccasins and snowshoes, with a courage that, because somewhat shy and trembling, evoked all the more his admiration, she untied the first knot of his rope, unwound the coil, and then untied the last knot. The process was slow because of the trembling of her fingers, 
which he felt but could not see. She stood resolute, making him dress for the storm upon the threshold of the door. He did not know how to strap on the snowshoes. She watched his first attempt with great curiosity. Looking up, he was made the more determined to succeed with them by seeing the pain of incredulity returning to her eyes. How do you expect me to know how to manage things that I have never handled in my life before? But if you don't know how to put them on, how can you walk in them? I've seen men walk in them, and there are a great many things we can do when something depends upon it. She directed him how to cross and tie the straps. She continued to watch him, increasing anxiety betraying itself in her face. The snow was so light that even the snowshoes sank some four or five inches. It was just below the porch that he had tied his straps, and when he first moved forward he trod with one shoe on top of the other. He had not expected this. He felt that no further progress was within the bounds of possibility. For some half minute he stood, his back to the door, his face turned to the illimitable regions of drifts and feathery air, unable to conceive how to go forward and without a thought of turning back. When his pulses were struggling and tingling with the discomfort of her gaze, he heard the door shut sharply. Perhaps she thought that he was shamming and was determined not to yield again. Perhaps, and this seemed even worse, she had been overcome in the midst of her stern responsibility by the powers of laughter. Perhaps, horrid thought, she had gone for Morin to bid him again throw the noose over his treacherous shoulders. The last thought pricked him into motion. By means of his reason he discovered that if he was to make progress at all the rackets must not overlap one another as he trod. His next effort was naturally to walk with his feet so wide apart that the rackets at their broadest could not interfere. The result was that in a few moments he became like a miniature colossus of roads, fixed again so that he could not move, his feet upon platforms at either side of a harbor of snow. He heard the door open now again sharply, and he felt certain yes, certain, that the lasso was on its way through the air. This time he was not going to submit. As men do unthinkingly what they could not do by way of thought, he found himself facing the door, his snowshoes truly inextricably mixed with one another, but still he had turned round. There was no rope, no moran. Madge was standing alone on the outer step of the porch, her face aflame with indignation. This is either perfect folly or you have deceived me, she cried. I shall learn how to use them in a minute, he said humbly. He was conscious as he spoke that his twisted legs made but an unsteady pedestal, that the least push would have sent him headlong into the drift. How could you say that you would go? she asked fiercely. He looked down at his feet as schoolboys do when chidden, but for another reason. The question as to whether or not he could get his snowshoes headed again in the right direction weighed like lead upon his heart. I thought that I could walk upon these things, he said, and he added, with such determination as honor flying from shame only knows, and I will walk on them and do your errand. With that, by carefully untwisting his legs, he faced again in the right direction, but, having lifted his right foot too high in the untwisting position, he found that the slender tail of his snowshoe stuck down in the snow, setting the shoe pointing skyward and his toe, tied by the thongs, held prisoner about a foot above the snow. He tried to kick, but the shoe became more firmly embedded. He lost his balance, and only by a wild fling of his body, in which his arms went into the air, did he regain his upright position. The moment of calm which succeeded produced from him another remark. It seems to me that you have got me now in closer bonds than before. As he spoke, he turned his glance backward and saw that comment of his was needless. The girl had at last yielded to laughter. Worn out, no doubt, by a long controlled excitement, laughter had now entirely overcome her. Leaning her head on her hand and her shoulders against the pillar of the porch, she was shaking visibly from head to foot, and the effort she made to keep the sound of her amusement within check only seemed to make its hold upon her more absolute. "'I don't wonder you laugh,' he said, feebly beginning to laugh a little himself. But she did not make the slightest reply. Her face was crimson. The ripples of her laughter went over her form as ripples of wind over a young tree. 
he was forced to leave her thus. By a miracle of determination, as it seemed, he freed his right shoe and made slow and wary strides forward. He saw that he had exaggerated the width of his snowshoes, but his progress now was still made upon the plan of keeping his feet wide apart, although not too wide for motion. He knew that this was not the right method. He knew that she peered at him between her fingers and was more convulsed with laughter at his every step. He was thankful to think that the falling flakes must soon begin to obscure his figure, and he did not dare to try another plan of walking while she watched, lest she should see him stop again. End of chapter 4